Hi, everyone. I'm Diana White. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation with the producers of The Unforgivable. Joining us, we have producer and actress Sandra Bullock and producer Graham King. And both Sandra and Graham have received the producer's mark on this film. We, as always, would love to thank our friends at Netflix for um, making this conversation today possible. And it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome our moderator, Gary Lucchese. Gary serves as partner and producer of the independent film company, Revelations Entertainment, as well as president emeritus of the PGA. Throughout his career, Gary has produced over 60 films, including Million Dollar Baby, Lincoln Lawyer, and The Underworld. Gary, thank you so much for being here and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, thanks so much, Diana. And welcome, Graham and Sandra. And um, I saw the movie last night. It's absolutely fantastic. It's um, emotional, strong, riveting, a superb performance from you, Sandra. It doesn't surprise me one bit. I knew you were gonna knock it out of the park, no question. And Graham, congratulations to you for finding this wonderful material. And uh, maybe we should start with that, just the, a little bit of the origin of this. I. I read that you you started. It was actually a mini series or a three hour uh, piece from the UK. So tell me how you what happened. Right. Yes. I think back in uh, two thousand and ten, uh, Colin Baines, who's who's an executive for me at the time, um, said he had just seen this uh, three part mini series on uh, I think it was Channel Four in the UK, and um, he suggested that I take a look at it as as doing a remake of a, an American film. And I, I remember watching it on the plane and I couldn't wait, you know, there was no phones on the plane or anything. I couldn't wait for the plane to land because I wanted to call the producers and tell them how interested I was on, on buying it and reformatting it. And uh, that's exactly what happened. I just, I just thought the story was so powerful and had so many undercurrent, underlying messages in it. And, you know, someone coming out of prison after serving their time, why can't they get a second chance in life? Mm -hmm. And um, that was that that to me and, 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 and the whole twist in the third act just just kind of like surprised me and, and, and blew me away. So I found it really powerful and like kind of in the sweet spot spot of the kind of films I like to make with the same. So term. you developed you developed that you bought you got option the rights you developed yep. a couple of screenplays. Yeah. Yeah, we developed it. It was um, there was so many different incarnations of it through the years, and we didn't quite get it off the ground. You know what that's like, Gary. You, you seem to get yeah, to the sure. starting line so many times, and then yeah. it pulls back, yeah. and 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 your busyness of your other life, you know, goes on. And um, you know, out of the blue, I get a call from um, Sandy's agent, and uh, Sandy said she would love to meet and talk about. Um, Unforgiven, you know, which was the 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 working title at the time, and the and the title. Right. Of the, uh, so, so, so let's go to the other side. So, Sandra, you're you're you know you have your company Fordist Films. I'm sure you're always looking for very interesting material. So, so your agent submits this screenplay to you, and you open it up and you start reading. And what was that like? Well, to be honest, it it came across my path before my falling in love with it. I okay. think in another incarnation and then it came back to me across my path again mm -hmm. and adjustments had been made that just struck a chord and I think I was mm -hmm. just in that time and place to see and understand the material a little better than I was probably when I first read it um mm -hmm. and uh reaching out to to Graham and having that conversation you know I was in a place where I was ready to produce again you know I was busy you know I was happy being a mom and doing the mm -hmm. work and coming home I didn't want to be away from them but realizing I didn't have to be away if I wanted to produce mm -hmm. and, and Graham to his credit didn't have to say yes I'll take you on as a partner he could have just said look this, is, this has been my baby for a while um, because I'm very opinionated um, mm -hmm. I had a lot of thoughts <laughs> um, but what was nice was I said the thing that's missing for me is the storytelling from a woman's point of view in this. That's the layer that to me was missing. And Graham, to his credit said, I'd never thought of that. Never thought of that. Mm -hmm. Of course, how, how, how could he? You know, he sees it through the eyes that he has from his life experience. And I said, to me, there's something in this that no one's allowed a woman to do um, because it's not mm -hmm. pretty. It's not the attractive version right. of a woman's pain and her experience. You know, I don't have the benefit of a 
gorgeous wardrobe or makeup or um, surroundings, which, you know, to Netflix's credit, they said, you know, they, they loved that idea um, versus I think had right. it been anywhere else, it would have been dressed up in a way that would have been completely inappropriate for this story. Right. And when you first read, when you, when you first, you and Graham first started talking, did you, did you start working on the script? Did you did more, did you do more work on the script before you approached directors or, or did you, or were you pretty much, let's go find a director now? Well, we did some work. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we had a meeting uh, too. Okay. So <laughs> we did a lot of work. Well, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so, so then did you take it to Netflix before you brought on, uh, Nora uh, Fingstein, or or did you bring on the, find a director first? Um, we we took it to Netflix. I mean, obviously, Sandy mm -hmm. just had made Bird Box there, and and she had the relationship mm -hmm. there. And 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 as soon as I think she showed interest in this, they started calling me. You know, saying oh, we'd love okay. to meet this with you. And uh, so it was kind of like it was kind of in tandem, one with the other. You know, we brought. Netflix wanted right. to make, we knew Netflix wanted to make it and we knew we wanted to find a filmmaker and Sandy was 100% right. And she said, I think this should be, should have a female behind the camera here mm -hmm. and, and tell the story through her lens. And um, um, someone who was involved in a project with me in the development stage, um, uh, Veronica Ferris, she called mm -hmm. me and she had just seen System Crasher um, at right. Berlin and she knew Nora and she said I think you should take a look at um, Nora's film and Sandy and I watched the film and I think a week later I flew to London and met with Nora and uh, that's how it all started and she came on board. Yeah that was that was a very interesting choice I I, um, I watched System I, I hadn't seen it but I watched uh, I haven't watched the whole thing but I watched a lot of it subsequent to to seeing your film last night and because I was curious about Nora and um, you can see that her style was um, was exactly right for this particular film and that she's you know quite an emotional filmmaker so you have a great meeting with her Graham and then S Sandra did you meet Nora separately or or what what was that like uh, meeting Graham was not going to leave two Germans in a room by themselves <laughs> <laughs> Did you, speak in, did, you speak in, did you speak in German so he wouldn't understand? I, the thing that I don't do is speak in German so everyone feels like they're being talked about. But what I helped Nora with right. was occasional translations into English. Um, right, right, right. You know, it's, it's uh, again, to Graham's credit and to Netflix's credit, you know, you find a filmmaker that has already the tone and sensibility for your story but yet that film, Amer what seems to be a very American story about our system, our class system, our judicial system, it, it could be, it, the class system exists everywhere, um, but specifically our, our system. And, and, and it's, it's a German woman who, who, who comes in with an outsider's point of view, yet that is exactly what was needed. Um, mm -hmm. And who comes from a documentary filmmaking background. So you already know that that person is going to dig into the details and be relentless. It's like a dog with a bone with Nora. Right, um, right, right. But in that process, the specificity became so important. Um, and that specificity about this world of poverty and the lack of resources and women within that world and system is absolutely heartbreaking. Those of us right. who are born into the very fortunate world of never having to worry about being engulfed by that system. Um, we'll never understand the choices that people have to make for survival because they know the darkness. Um, so once once we had Nora on board, we went to Netflix. I remember that day at you know at the hotel and they right. were having a convention with Scott Stuber and he just sat in the room opposite and he goes, is this the woman? Is this who you want? And we were mm -hmm. like, yep, this is who we want. And then we left and we were like, hmm, now we have to go make this story, um, which requires a lot of deep digging, and she's absolutely unafraid of it. Absolutely. Okay, so let's let's talk about the pre-production then, because I, I find that fascinating. So you've chosen Nora, and you're I take it you're in Los Angeles at the time. What you went to see various prisons, and where were the prisons that you that you went to? Did you go to prisons in California, in Louisiana, Texas, Washington, Washington, Washington. State? 
where, where the oh, okay right yeah okay so you wanted to see that sort of verisimilitude yeah because right. for Nora the specificity of mm -hmm. the location and the slight adjustments of law and how people are processed in the court system are, are different mm -hmm. than those mm -hmm. of California and Louisiana so it was right. really right. important to just center and get an idea of this piece of the pie right yeah. so and, then, and that's where you also probably discovered that a fishery would be a place uh, where 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 an, a parolee could work is is that where that came from or it, there, there are certain <laughs> I places i mean i actually wanted some new life skills and i said you know what i'm i'm in love with a fisherman so i feel like to give right. a gift back to him i should learn how to fillet right. it. it just is oh okay no no it um Grandma, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, you know, there there are industries that mm -hmm. embrace people who are convicts. Convicts right. have very, very limited resources when they get out, and women have even less than men. Mm -hmm. it's, it was heartbreaking right. and astounding to me. Um, yeah, I found the shelter that you were you were staying in, uh, that that your parole officer uh, introduced you to, you know very 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 sad very very difficult um and that's the nice version right 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 i sandy and nora also met with uh, a couple of women that had just come out of prison mm -hmm. right and then we yeah. did those meetings up in up in washington as well yeah no we we were again you feel um as an actor you you feel so I don't, I don't know what the word is. We have the luxury of going in and invading these people's lives and asking them to be transparent so that we can make a movie, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. on top of that, we're going into a woman's prison. The first round was the women who were in still incarcerated, mm -hmm. um, who agreed to give us their time. Um, and by the time you leave, you realize, oh, I can always leave at the end. We're going to go have lunch. Where's my coffee? You know, and you are in this world. And by the time you leave, there's a shroud of shame and sadness and embarrassment because you had no idea, nor how would you, how would mm -hmm. you know unless you bother to go in and see that world. Right. And what these women shared um, was incredible. And then the women who'd been released and who were trying to figure out how to survive in the new modern world was just as heartbreaking. Um, right. And the only thing and they kept It's so interesting that you did it all with Nora too. So you must have really, you know, this, whatever it was, was two months, couple months journey through so you really must have bonded. Um, well, Nora and I did. I mean, I you know, Nora and I did it at the same time, yet did it on our own, because right. we're both incredibly bullheaded. We're very, mm -hmm. Graham's just like the Graham's tears will attest to that. <laughs> we're very stubborn in how we do our research and execute our craft. And there's the demand for I need my time to sort of take in. I don't want to have to fight with someone else's questions. So we unconsciously or consciously made the decision to have, she would scout, and then I would be having the meeting. Then I would, you right. know, and I, we sort of, and, and um, again, we're coming into these women's lives, asking them to share their greatest pain. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want it to be by committee. Right. I mm -hmm. want them to have a human being opposite personal. them. And right, right. Very personal. Right. And so, and that must have influenced your casting choices too, right? For sure. I mean, so, well, well, Graham, you want to jump in? Because like, I know you've um, got Yeah, I'm not sure that that influence. I mean, again, we wanted to go for, you know, the want of a better word, an ensemble cast that mm -hmm. really fitted these characters of actors that really fitted these roles. And, um, right. you know, I thought, you know, and obviously having the support of Netflix was wonderful, you know, getting Viola in, in the movie and, and Rob Morgan, right. and, uh, Vincent D'Onofri and, you know, right. and Nora went off and, you know, met with uh, a lot of um, actors to play the, the brothers. And she found mm -hmm. these two guys and, and would put them in a room, you know, and put them on camera and, and found chemistry between these these two on the four actors. So you were casting via Zoom at this point, or were you casting in, in a room? No, it was, was in a room. This was, was before the be pandemic. Yeah. yeah. So this, and this was where in Los Angeles? No. LA, New York. I remember it Nora going to New York and meeting the guys. So it's LA and New York. Yeah, but it was it was before right. the pandemic. So right, was, right. And the thing that was I, nice too was, Graham, remember like we when we were in Vancouver, there was a pool of, 
of we wanted such authenticity for inside that transitional house. Mm -hmm. How do you put out a casting release that says you have to look as though you have been through hell right. Right. and feel authentic in this world right. to match the Ruth Slater that's coming into this world? And the bravery and the openness and vulnerability that the actors that we found in Vancouver gave us. I mean, it was like, we just were like, be in this world with us, share your life experience, even though it's silently. And you right. look at every single person who's in that transitional home and you're like, what is that person's story? You know, that they come with such pain, um, but yet the beauty of being vulnerable enough to go, I'm gonna present myself showing how hard my <laughs> life was so it can be authentic for this storytelling. So Vancouver right. provided us with, such great um, human beings that understood this story really, really, really well. Right. So um, I, I love the relationship that you had with Bernthal, um, mm. Andrew. I thought it was just so honest and um, it just just totally real. So was was that was that? Did you did you read a bunch of actors? Or did you just think about John and offer it to him, or how did that happen? That it was a letter, right? It was like yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah he, had to be, he, had to, he had to be convinced a little bit. He wasn't, remember Graham, like he wasn't in a place in his career where facilitating um, a story like this, which he loved and very much identified with because of his right. life experience. I um, mean, you see that, you see it and you feel it. Yeah. Right. Um, but to be what appeared on the script to be a second fiddle to this, this, what seemed to be the primary story wasn't mm -hmm. where his trajectory in his career is going. As you see, he's, he's exploding. He's, he's just, he's right. John Bernthal. Right. Everyone right. you mentioned about John Bernthal, they go, oh my God, did you right. see him in this? But the begging and the pleading and convincing that, no, you don't understand because you are representing society, but he's also representing Ruth. When you see when the, the, the twist happens with him, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he's got to straddle two worlds right sure and john only john could have done that because of his life right yeah and when he confesses that he too was an ex-con i thought that was really a powerful moment that was incredibly yeah. important to john that that be absolutely right. authentic he's not going to do the movie dialogue about that he's going to be authentic in what would be said how you would react how painful that would be knowing that in the system these two convicts could not spend any time together in their lifetime because of their, you know, because of it. And was the, was, was the Viola and Vincent D'Onofrio relationship, was that the way it was in the screenplay as well, where you had uh, um, a couple of, of um, uh, you know, a black woman with a, a Caucasian man? Is that, was that, was that how it was scripted or did that, was that something you guys brought to it? No, we, we brought that to it. It wasn't, it wasn't scripted that way um, for an interracial couple. Um, right. It was really interesting, and and again, you know, you know this, Gary, is when you're producing a film and you've got a wonderful piece of material that actors really gravitate to, whether whether no matter how big or small the role is, it's about the subject matter. Correct. So both Vincent and Viola love these characters and right. saw something and in it, it. But it's also but it's also about a couple of scenes too. When Viola and Sandra have their confrontation, right, and she says that if it were a black woman that had killed a cop, she would have never gotten out. That was um, th that was that was a powerful powerful moment, and it was interesting too, Sandra, because you play you, you play um, uh, your your character um, it's, it's so restrained most of the time. Ruth is so restrained, but in that scene, for the first half of the film, yeah, yeah. And, but in that in that scene, you guys go at it, and it's and uh, it really makes the scene just incredible, uh, just an just an incredibly powerful scene, and when she realizes if she's the one who first deduces that something else had happened that's really um it's 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 one of the great moments of the movie i think well yeah. what was so remember graham we were at my house in the living room and all of us i felt it felt this way i'm probably just you know flowering it up but it felt like we all came up with viola at the same time right and we were like what do you mean you came up with viola i came up with like graham's right. like no i thought about it so what I love about that familial relationship is that we don't say, here's an interracial couple. It's just a family right. who is um, working hard to have their dream, the American dream. 
-hmm. And it's in this gorgeous home outside of town. Um, they are the haves, they are not the have nots. They have these two beautiful children. But here comes this woman that's threatening everything that they know and love. Mm -hmm. And when Viola says to Vincent, you know, she's angry at him for taking on this case. She says, if these were your two black sons, they right. would be dead. Right, that's right. And that's to right. me, every time she says that, I, I get really choked right. up. And when she comes outside at the end and says, you are not a victim, because again, you have this character that is unrelenting, unapologetic, not asking for redemption or forgiveness. She just wants what she wants. Right. And when Viola's character goes after her, you fully understand that that character that Viola plays knows exactly where Ruth came from. Mm -hmm. Yet the difference between the two of them are their choices. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. when she says that, you just go mind blown. There's just so uh, many things that come out of Viola's mouth that coming out of anybody else's mouth that didn't have brown skin would not have impacted the story the way that it did. Vi Viola's a treasure. She's so, oh, she's, 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 so, she's yeah. a treasure. And I love the dynamic between she and D'Onofrio. I bought it completely. I thought they were oh. just a fascinating, wonderful couple. Yeah. They have a lot of chemistry, um, those two. Yeah, and and the 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 young girl, uh, Katie, was mm -hmm. with both both of the young girls were excellent too. By the way, what is the song that Katie is playing at her recital at the end? I was waiting for the end credits, but Radiohead. it wasn't. Radiohead. Oh, it's Radiohead. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I knew I knew that song. Okay. A um, <laughs> couple more questions. So so you start shooting. Were you, did you shoot in continuity? Were you trying to shoot in continuity um, before you were interrupted? <laughs> No, I don't think we. I don't think we were. I don't. I don't. I, I, it didn't make sense production wise to do that. Um, we we were on a tight schedule. Um, you know, Was it forty days, forty five days. What, some, what, how many yeah, days? I mean, it started out. What well, it started out and when it ended, obviously, you know, with the pandemic yeah, right. break, the lockdown in in the middle. Um, right. But it, it was, you know, we had a wonderful team, and you know, right. our, our line producer Nan Morales is, you know, very right. experienced and experience up in the Pacific Northwestern border, wonderful crew. And, you know, you can feel, Gary, you know this, when everyone's making a film because of the material, mm -hmm. because they're engaging in the story as opposed to just right. taking a job. And that's what this was like. You know, and right. we had so many ups and downs and our DP, you know, <laughs> our DP <laughs> got injured, slipping down the hall, and I had knee replacement surgery. So oh, we're both okay. on crutches on set. <laughs> And, and it, there was there was like, you know, again, there's always hurdles, right? When you're making a film, but this right. one, you know, <laughs> uh, seemed to be especially tough. But you, right. you, you, the crew just persevered through because again, you know, we're all watching these wonderful actors bring this performance sure. to this. Sure, so let me ask you this when you, just out of curiosity, because it seemed like you shot for almost a month and then you stopped for six months or so, and then you came back. During that interim time, did you, did you cut, did you see cut footage? Did you analyze what you had? Did you make alterations for when you came back that you were gonna make certain slight adjustments? <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. definitely, definitely. And came up with some other ideas, some radical ones. Um, Graham wanted uh, me dead so badly. He goes, can we just do an <laughs> ending where she gets killed? And I'm like, is this something that you personally want to see or do you think this benefits the story, Graham? What is it? Come on. Is it <laughs> You know, we had the time and obviously we're in a lockdown position. So you keep thinking right. about what we haven't shot and is there a, you know, a different place to take these characters. Right, one right. Day I called Sandy and I said, what do you think about if we kill your character at the end, if you tragically <laughs> get killed after going through this whole journey? And I love a good death. I'm, I would right. love to die. We were all for it. It was actually in our script as an alternative ending for a really right long time. That, that would have been bad. That would have been bad, Sandy. Oh, you did the right I'm, ending. <laughs> I mean, I think I could die beautifully. Hey, I could have drawn it out. I would have suffered silently. No, I would have no. had like the tear perched on the edge, just like as life went out of my eyes, but yet that tear still holding on, you know, I would have, I think I could have done a good job. But oh, something wow. like that I think is really important to bring up, which is, you, you know, we did get shut down in the middle. Mm -hmm. We were able to edit what we had to mm -hmm. see what was working, what wasn't working. Because as you know, you think you're making one film and all of a sudden something organically becomes much more emotional and beautiful 
that wasn't on the page necessarily. And I okay, think- Okay, so tell us, what was that? What was that? The audience wants to know, give us one insight. Um, for me, the, the trifecta of the mother's journeys, you had three mothers in this. I was a sister, but there was, what is a family? What is parenting? What, is, what does it mean to be a family? Um, mm -hmm. And when we saw what we had from the first half, we brought in an incredible writer, Courtney Miles, who mm -hmm. works with Fincher. She understands, you know, she was an AD for 30 years. She had all these skills that we had to have in order to execute the second half in the time of COVID, which was scary is shit for all of us. None of us knew how to navigate this world. None of us right. knew how to continue an intimate handheld film when we are, I don't want six feet. I was like, keep everyone 20 feet away from me. And we had right. masks and shields and Viola and I had not shot our scene yet. So yeah. when we came back, we had an extraordinary crew that figured out how to navigate. We all came up with our own protocols for Netflix. You know, mm -hmm. grandma will attest to that. We're like, okay, this is what we have. Let's add another layer and another layer. We wanted our crew to go home the same way they got there. We didn't want right. our desire to finish a movie to be to the detriment of anyone's family or lives. Right, right, um, right. So you're carrying that weight. And then we had to shoot the scene with Viola, which is the end of our film, mm -hmm. almost right out of the gate as we picked up that second half of our shoot in shields right. and masks. So anytime I'm yelling, she's shielded. I couldn't touch right. her. I couldn't get up in her face. I couldn't, right. you know, it was the oddest thing. It was the oddest right. thing, but safety became paramount, but it was so fear making and, 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 and frustrating and, and dark that in a weird way, I think it also infused the energy that we had that probably was right. rather helpful. You know, it was just, Weird times, very, very I'll strange. tell you, I'll tell you, and now, I'm now you're now I'm inclined to go back and look at the film again. But when I saw that scene, I didn't think for a second, oh, I wish you'd gotten tighter on it. For some yeah. reason, it seemed mm -hmm. absolutely logical to keep that distance. It felt quite organic to me. And I thought it was, like I said, arguably maybe the best scene, one of the best scenes in the movie. And um, I didn't feel that, that you had uh, shortchanged the, the quality of the film at all. So uh, how yeah. did you... When did you do the flashbacks? Did you do the flashbacks at the very end? Uh, because, you know, you've got some really important flashbacks and I was, I, I'm sure they were written into the screenplay, right? Yeah. But when did you, did you shoot them at the end because you had kind of knew what the movie was or did you were shooting them along, all, all, all along the way? What, how was that done? It, it was more along the way, um, our memories. Uh, um, um, and, and, and we, again, you know, there was the upside to having the uh, lockdown break is we could see, you know, where we needed maybe a little more of the memories or a little more of the, uh, uh, the sister relationship. And, you know, going back to your previous question, Gary, I, for me, it was getting to see what we had shot kind of alleviated a lot of the paranoia I had is that, you know, Ruth didn't become too victim-y too early in the film. Right. You know, and the way Sandy played it, you know, because, you, you know, again, she didn't have a lot of dialogue. She had no one to really talk to. She had no support from anyone. So you had to get into her brain of where she was going with this and what she was thinking. And, you know, there's certain scenes where I'm thinking if the audience are feeling too much empathy for her now, the third act's not going to pay off so much. You know, right. so it was it was wonderful to see that and then build on that for the rest of the film. Right, right. I mean, the scene where you go after Richard Thomas and, and um, I can't, I'm sorry, right. I've got the, 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 the actress. Uh, those were great scenes. And were they done in the second half or the first half? Was that, was that early first, on or? First, first half. half. That was the wow. first half. Yeah, that was the first half. I think that was one of the last scenes we shot before. Yeah, it was. I came home for the weekend and that was the end of it. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then oh. Sandra goes and destroys the plasterboard and you know dismantles her place i thought that was great that's, yeah. that's again like what a women just don't women are not allowed to express this kind of emotion right through the beginning of time we are not supposed to be angry we are not supposed to be resentful we're not supposed to be violent we're not supposed to have rage we're not supposed to grieve like that everything is supposed to be done in a pretty way and mm -hmm. It's just, it's, you just keep going, why? Why does that make you less 
female? Why does that make you less of a mother? Why does that make you, when you are expressing the rage and the hurt and the anger for what has been done, why? Mm -hmm. So it's, it was, look, I, I, I always envision how I would be in a street fight. I always win. Um, <laughs> I, I, you, I have that rage and you feel, I'm not, I have to find something else to do with this anger. And then after we did this film, I, I, you just ask yourself, why? Why do we have to find something else? Men get to go have a beat, beat the crap out of each other in a bar and then they dust it off and they're fine. Right. We have right. to hold it and let it fester and we get sick and we are supposed to look good while we're in pain. And I just don't understand it. Well, having met these women, I, 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 the awe that I feel for them, that they are still here and have hope. They had a sense of hope that when they got out, things would be different. When they got out, what brought them here and all that pain would be different. Society would be easier for them than being inside. And little do you know, they say nine times out of 10, it is so hard, like the sensory overload, the environment, the change of technology, the change of how the system works. How do you get $40 upon your exit, which is what you get in this wow. one prison, $40 in a bag of used clothes. And then they demand you get a cell phone, you check in with your PO, you figure out a bus system that's always late. You cannot be late, you have to be on time. I mean, how, how does that work? Yeah. Nine times out of 10, they find they come right back because there's no way to survive out there. Right. Okay. So, so you finished the movie, you screened it, I presume, right? Did you, did you test it? Did, no. We so had, we had, we had, a, we had a virtual. Yeah. We had a virtual. <laughs> had a virtual. Right. Great, Gary. Crazy experience ever yeah. to yeah. see people <laughs> watch your film rather than to see the back of their heads. Right. Can I right, just say, right. Graham, I mean, didn't you feel that? The, the, the pandemic and how you had, you had to virtually screen it. I remember how affected you were by being able to see their reaction versus you're, in a, you're like, I'm going to a preview tonight. We're gonna to be in the back of the room seeing nice hairstyles from behind. You don't, right, right. You don't see the organic reaction when people think they're not being watched. And right. this way you saw how they were moved and what moved them right as it was happening in real time. It was natural. Right. You, it wasn't like, you know, to please a, a focus group, someone in a focus group always wants to be heard. You know, they know the filmmakers are sitting right. behind sure. or something. It felt really natural and organic to just to see their reaction to scenes that really at the end of the movie, they didn't really have to say much because we could see it. You know, right. it, obviously the downside is, is you always feel the atmosphere in a theater. You know, sure. and you know when you know maybe the scene, the movie's playing a bit too long, or something. Right. You start seeing the movement. This, right. in this case, they would go off to the kitchen, get some food, come back, and whatever. Um, don't leave the movie. You know, <laughs> but it, it was terrifying, but also very, yeah. very informative for what right. we needed. And you and and was there a reason why you didn't uh, do the festival route? Because this is obviously a movie that is going to be competitive. Done. Oh, you yeah. weren't done. Oh, you weren't done. You weren't finished. We okay. literally at like 9.58 on a Tuesday wow. evening with a Hans Zimmer queue versus another queue versus the other Hans Zimmer queue. It was literally, they were told us that Tuesday, we had to be finished. We had everyone waiting in the studio virtually. We had to pick the queue. Like everything was it the, down to the wire. This was the most complicated film. We would change one slight intent. We would watch the whole film and realize we'd unraveled something that happened later right. on. It right. was, Very we cool. were not finished. Okay. And guess what? That happens. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, we had those conversations to sacrifice for a festival, but really, you know, we were so, I mean, Sandy, Sandy's passion for this film on every single call with the composer, with the editor. I mean, we went through it daily. It was, it was daily. And like Sandy said, it was one of those kind of films where, well, let's try this and try that. But then we had to see the whole right. film on the run again, you know, to do that. And Sandy went off and made a movie or two during this time. And, you know, she was coming off to set and, and joining in on the calls. And it was, we, we were all very hands-on and it was, all, it was a great team. You know, everyone yeah. could see what we were uh, the goal we were trying to get at the end and Netflix was so wonderful having the patience but like I said at some point he said Sandy and I that's it you've yeah. got to deliver well, the film and, <laughs> and as and as we all know there are times when when a film is sort of a little bit under the radar that comes in 
from the outside and can all of a sudden um, really captivate everyone, you know? So- I mean, um, you, you hope? I mean, I think Graham is as different as we might seem. I mean, we didn't know each other from Adam and right. then being thrown together and I'm, you know, I'm so panicked about not being heard and not being able to, to bring what I need to the table. And I know I come in like a, a bull in a China shop and to Graham's credit, he, he let me. And, you know, we, we got, we had one, we, we butted heads like early on. And after that, it was like the dam broke of, of the joy, because we realized we might've come from different worlds, but what we want in our work ethic is exactly the same. And Graham didn't have to invite me in. He didn't have to make me an equal partner. He didn't have to do that. Um, but I demanded it. I'm like, I'm here, I'm doing the work. And his ego is such that he's like, look, and he would always say, I don't care how many names are on this film. I just want a great film. How right. many people do you experience in this business that have his career are generous with the title like that? And being the actress that likes to produce, you're always fighting the stigma of, okay, here comes the actress who wants to produce. And I'm like, I know. So I just keep my head down and you just do the work and you hope it's successful and everyone gets their money back and friends are made and you move on. And, um, but I, 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 I gotta say like, he didn't have to give me the space. He gave me, by the way, it doesn't surprise me one bit, Sandy. It doesn't that the two of you would get along and that he would invite you in. I mean, this was, this is a tour de force request of an actor to just go all in on a part. And, and uh, I haven't worked with you, but I, I know you by reputation and you have a gut about, about Sandra Bullock that when she commits to something, she's, she's really committed. She's all in. Sure. Yeah, you she's know, all Gary, in. A lot of actors say we want to produce as well, right? We yeah. see it every day. And, and, and right. they, a lot of actors really don't know either what that means or they just have another right. agenda or whatever. Not with Sandy. I mean, Sandy right. was on every single call. She showed up everywhere. And again, you know, she's shooting a movie, I think in the Dominican Republic. And well, don't pretend like you forgot. You knew exactly where I was. I felt the jealousy, <laughs> the rage. I would come home from work tired. You're like, oh, I'm sorry. Were you by a waterfall sequence today in the Dominican <laughs> Republic? I'm like, yes, Graham. And yet here I am on this Zoom. You she's exactly sending me, yeah, way. she's sending me pictures of her on a beach with martinis. Um, and, I'm not a martini, I'm not a martini drinker, he lied. <laughs> the English and, lie. Right, and, and, and again, you know, every, every single, you know, session that we went through, Sandy was, was there front and center. And we both, right. as, as she said, you know, we had one little kind of disagreement at the beginning, but we both were in alignment with the same film we wanted to make. And, you know, Nora became like our child with that. Child, we right. called her child. And, and, our um, child today. She's the really Saturday. interesting part, Gary, was, you know, the male-female point of view on this film. I think, you know, if Sandy wouldn't have been on the film and just been acting or, you know, let's say she wasn't in the film, I would have maybe made a slightly different film and mm -hmm. not gotten that female point of view, because how would I know? You know, so it was really interesting. And obviously having a filmmaker, German filmmaker director, and the Germans, as you know, are, you know, a key to every kind of detail. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and the chemistry was there between the three of us, you know, from the get go. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we were good. We were a good triangle. Uh, look, guys, um, I love the movie. It did an extraordinary job, really. Sandra, congratulations. It's it's. Um, Thank you. Well, I mean, but look, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't I wanted surprise to make me. the movie that you made. You made million you, you, dollar made, and I couldn't I know, get it. I know. And it was like <laughs> I remember. It was like no one wanted to make it with me, and then you got it made, and it's just one of the most special films. Like it. it oh, then you go. You, you know you what? Good. I wasn't supposed to make that film. That's why I couldn't get it made. Um, so you, you know, there was, I have there was a different, there was a different director at that time too, yes, as I recall. Was. Yes, there was. Yeah. <laughs> so well, your film, um, Gary, always has a special place in my heart, as you, as you know. <laughs> which film for you? <laughs> Sorry. Which, which film for you does he have a special place? Well, million Dollar one, Baby. Oh really? Were you supposed yeah. to? Yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. We were sitting, at, we were singing, sitting in the Kodak, and it was Million Dollar Baby versus Aviator. Oh. That's See, right. <laughs> you and I both have a pain about Million Dollar Baby. <laughs> sorry, sorry. And as exactly. a Million Dollar Baby was a movie that came in from the outside at the very end. Nobody even one, knew one it. Little, one little line, Mr. Eastwood came up to Scorsese <laughs> and I at the Warner Brothers party because we were in the same <laughs> studio uh, yeah. the night before the Oscar party or whatever. And he yeah. turned to Marty and I and he said, 
Look, I really want to win it tomorrow. If I don't, I hope you do. But I really want to win right. it. <laughs> there was no answer to give to that. <laughs> oh, well. oh, well. But look, congratulations, guys. And I think you're going to be doing a lot of publicity in the next next couple of months because this thing deserves every accolade it gets. It really does. Thank you. And thank you on behalf of the PGA. And I'm glad you both got the PGA marks. And um, kudos to you guys. Really Great congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.